four, five, ten. And my son would use it really four, five. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. What week was he born? He was, well, he was actually a little bit I was a little bit too. Oh. Uh -huh. so, but that was before he said that Snoopy right. lost his low birthday. So, and then he, um, then he became my like, I seen it. So he was in the to go. So, anyhow, I'm very thankful for that. Well, then I'm strong. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I love seeing your favorite little baby. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, but, um, I was going to say, you know, if you drove all the way up here and then drive to the bottom two, yeah. And yeah. no, so it's <laughs> like, you know, I was like, so my GPS on 60 minutes. Wow. Right. Because you're not going to be here for home first. No, I don't know. Yeah, did Wow. Yeah. Water. You should see a water fountain by the bathroom. There's a water fountain. Yeah. 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 We'll start in about two minutes. Thank <laughs> 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 Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you did. And holy all of a sudden, his whole Man, I was like, he might be Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, when I uh, debated the two or three, I'm sorry, Mary, for the 30s. I don't think I have been. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I know. It's an that we. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Morning. Good morning. Good. My name is Christian Mergen. 
I am the manager of public programs with the York County History Center. Thank you for coming to our June edition of our second Saturday program. Uh, so today we have <laughs> after earning a bachelor's in history and secondary education from York College in 2012, Jamie Norpel landed her dream job at Milton Hershey School, where she teaches history to ninth and tenth graders. Since then, she's earned her master's and PhD in American studies from Penn State with a focus on agriculture, environmental studies, African American literature, and folklore. In her free time, she builds on the public life history of York County. She co-founded a website called Witnessing York, writes a local history blog for York Daily Record, called Wandering in York County, films videos through a series called Hometown History, and launched Project Penny Cutter, an initiative to install a permanent monument to York's Potter's Field, which leads us right into our presentation for today. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's Jamie and your help. Thank you, everyone. Um, so today's presentation will last about an hour. And as a teacher, I think about you sitting there for an hour uh, on a Saturday morning. So thank you for being here. I made a worksheet for you if you want to do it. You do not have to by any means. It's totally voluntary. Just want to get past that. Yeah. I printed enough. So. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So the worksheet is just for fun. You do not have to fill it out at all. It's just something for you to take notes on and just kind of follow along. So today's presentation is called Project Penny Heavens, the Unmarked Grave in Potter's Field. My agenda is going to start with reviewing gravestones around the area and what they mean, the symbolism, then get into the history of York City Cemetery, and then I'll finish with current efforts with Project Penny Heaven and how we're trying to raise money for the monument. To get started as our warm up, at the top of your worksheet, if you want to follow along, it says, who has the right to a written death? Can you think of any group of people or a person or, I mean, God can write anyone that you think deserves to have their history remembered forever? Take a second and write down your ideas in that box there at the very top. So for this presentation, we're going to talk about people who, in my mind, deserve to be written down forever. But historically, your ethnicity and your gender and your class, all these things dictated if you had the right to a written death or not. So today I'm going to go into the history behind stone epitaphs, or in the case of Penny Heaven, the lack thereof, looking for clues behind the people and the community that lived there 100 years ago. And historically, who has had their, their life written down. So I'll go into the first part of my agenda, reading cemeteries and what they mean. Right across York is Prospect Hill. And if you go there, Prospect Hill, it's pretty easy to read their cemeteries. When you look at the mausoleums, when you think about the class and the wealth that was required to build these, these are not cheap, they're very expensive, and they're buried above ground, which is kind of rare. Usually, where county is like to be buried below the ground. And this picture shows you just how many stones are there. So if you ever wanted to go for a walk and look and read them, you can learn things about their last name, um, their ethnicity, when they were born, when they died. And even personal interests and flares like the size and the shape of their monuments. So what we do is when we study uh, city cemeteries, what we do is we look at material culture. So for those of you who are interested in history, these are some terms that you can add to your lexicon. Material culture are tangible things that you can hold in your hand. So for example, a baseball is an example of material culture. And what you do is you study material culture to then better understand our non-material culture. These are things that you can't hold in your hand. They're non-tangible things like belief systems or language um, or like oral traditions. So for example, a baseball is material culture, but let's say everyone on earth that ever knew how to play baseball ceased to exist. 
you wouldn't know how to play it anymore. Playing baseball is non-material culture. So by studying gravestones, the material culture, we better understand the values behind them, which is non-material. So we'll look at an example. This is down in Wilderton Cemetery. This is Cadora State Park. Has anyone been down to Cadora State Park? So in York County? Okay, just one. So there is a cemetery there that you can visit. Uh, and here are two gravestones that caught my attention. On the left is Clara, and on the right is Jacob. Anyone want to guess why they're positioned that way with Clara on the left and Jacob on the right? There's some symbolism here. Think about something that happens that was very important to two people at the beginning of their relationship. That's how they got married. They're supposed to symbolize when you're married and you're standing together at the altar. So that is why they're positioned that way. So if you look at your worksheet, if you want to follow along, it says, how can we denote a sense of equality between the two? So when you look at these headstones, what are some things that you see that are similar? Same shape. Good. They're the exact same size, the exact same shape. Here's some things that I noticed. They're side by side. They're facing the exact same direction. Even the images, the images, the material. I mean, they're they're darn um, close to being identical. And this is during the 1800s. So before women could vote, the fact that they recognized Clara alongside her husband as equals was kind of profound. But there's also, it's kind of difficult to see in this image, there's a way that we can see that there are inequalities or differences between men and women during this time period. Does it by chance say Clara wife of? You got it. You're exactly right. <laughs> Says Clara, his wife, whereas his has his last name. Yep. So if something were to happen in his headstone, we wouldn't know her last name. It would just say Clara, wife of. Yep, not said. So I want to be very careful in that. Uh, yes, of course, when I am buried, do I want my last name on my headstone? Absolutely. But this was 150 years ago. We don't want to apply current day values to the past. It was different back then. And so this wasn't, I don't want to bash Jacob for not appreciating his wife. This was just the common tradition of the time period. The gravestones can also be an art form. This was a slate stone um, that was hand chiseled. So to create slate headstones, you would have had to use time consuming soft loads over several, several um, hours so that you'd be able to have this image on the slate. So it took a long time for them to do. And if I were to zoom out on the front, the pinwheels, and you can see DOD guesses for what that means. Date of death, 1809. So this is a very old cemetery. I studied under folklorist Simon Bronner. He was a professor at Penn State Harrisburg, and he is the leading folklorist uh, across the country. He, he is amazing. And when I reached out to him uh, about this image, he told me that images like this are symbolic of a German heritage. He said these were public statements recognizing the individual as a family member and a member of the Pennsylvania German community. So when you think of Germans, what are some popular images that you think of? Roses? How about tulips, hearts, angels? Where have we seen German tulips and hearts and birds and angels? Lancaster. Yeah, Lancaster. Have you ever seen Proctor? Yeah. So Proctor, these there are beautiful artworks created by the Pennsylvania Germans that would have shown baptismal records, marriage records, death certificates. And you can see the birds and the tulips and the hearts, and they use the exact same ones in their headstones as well. There's also some other underlying values that I thought are really interesting in this headstone right here. So this headstone on the right shows a lot of stars. And stars, in my interpretation, show us pride and patriotism. Well, if you look at the headstone in 1793, what was happening in the country at the end of the 1700s? The country was just born. America was a, a brand new nation. 
And so gravestones today, you don't see as many stars unless you're a veteran, but people who passed during the late 1700s, stars are very common because of the value of patriotism and supporting your country. It's also this really cool hole in it. I interpret this as there's an eternity of no beginning, no end. It also invites you to go up and touch it so you're a part of it. And then I think of the pain felt by the family when their loved ones died. Maybe for them, it was a symbol of a hole in their heart that was left behind. <clears throat> Here is the last sunstone we're going to look at in Wildesen. Um, this is hand parked, it is in German, and you can denote the socioeconomic status of the person who has a, a, a part of this stone because there is a typo in it. Uh, instead of saying I rot, it says uh, there's an A in it. It means for here rest in German. And so they misspelled it on the headstone, which they probably should have taken the time to figure it out. But this is before really the printing press, right about that time period. So people weren't as literate, books weren't as, as common. Um, and so I just thought it was really interesting that you can also figure out this person probably wasn't uh, super educated for them to be able to talk the stone. Uh, so finally, when you look at changes too, this. So the one I just showed you, here is the slate. And then in the late 1700s, we're going to change to this headstone. Carvers deviated from the slate gray and red headstones, and they went more towards marble and limestone. They also became taller and thinner, and they're a lot more for meats. And I think it's because they viewed it as a certificate of a worthy death. When you think of a certificate, it's white and it stands tall and has lots of like ornate detail. Well, that's how they started having their headstones as well. So more uh, vertical and more embellishment in general. This shows the upward social mobility of the Germans. So next time when you're walking through an old cemetery that has a lot of slate, think the original settlers, they didn't have a lot of wealth, but then as um, society changed and people acquired more income, they wanted to show that off when they died. Now, moving into the second part of today's presentation, this is now York City Cemetery specifically and the history of that. And to start on your worksheet there, I have this map. Take your pen or pencil and circle where you think City Cemetery is. We're looking at Prospect Hill. Oh. Well, I know where You do know where it is. <laughs> So if you pointed to or tripled that area, that city cemetery, it is a one acre plot right to the right of Prospect Hill. If you were to leave the uh, history center today and drive up George Street, there you can see the green space of Prospect Hill. And then city cemetery is that little tiny green box on the right, right to the left of the red arrow. Uh, if you're trying to, I highly encourage viewers online and the audience here today to go and actually visit it. Um, you're going to learn more about the history with me today, but there's something very special about being there and seeing it firsthand that you can't replicate um, in, in a space that's not connected. So if you're to go there, it's up North George, and then where District Pie is, if you make a left on 7th, then that is where you can see uh, Schley Alley. Be careful with parking. Um, there really isn't any parking there. It's actually better to park on George and then walk over. For the first time in my life, I had the cops following me because I parked uh, uh, on the edge of the city cemetery in the grass. And someone called the cops and said that someone was driving all over the graves. Uh, and I had to explain that I'm a research and historian, and I know for a fact that no one's buried where I was parked, but I still had to move. And honestly, it's good that someone called it. it means they're caring and they're looking out and they're they're observing and kind of being uh, safeguards of the cemetery. So it was a good thing, but be careful where you're um, This is what the field looks like. There's really no headstones. So compare this to what I showed you at the beginning of today's presentation with Prospect Hill and even the Wilderson Cemetery. It's very, very different. So where we get the name Potter's Field is actually biblical. When you think of uh, Judas and how he betrayed Jesus, he wanted to repent from his sins. So he took 30 pieces of silver and he went to the priest and said, I'm sorry for my sins, here's me repenting. The priest viewed that as blood money. I said, we don't want any of your money specifically for the church. So instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna use your silver and we're gonna purchase this plot of land 
where we can bury people who are poor and can't afford burial plots. It happened to be where the local potters went and got their clay. So that's why it's called Potter's Field. And that and Potter's Field is not unique to York. Uh, Potter's Fields are all across the country and world for that matter. So who would, would have been buried in Potter's Field? Um, mostly people whose society would have unfairly deemed worthless or illegitimate. Um, I interpret it as the country was trying to cover up the town's ills by just covering them up in these uh, unmarked graves. So they would have been non-Christians, unwed mothers, criminals, babies, people who weren't baptized, and others who were considered morally loose. When in the beginning of today's presentation, I asked you who has the right to a written death, historically, these would have been people who would have been excluded from society who would not have had their, their names written down. Where I showed you City Cemetery is today is not the original location. It used to be down across from Penn Park. So we are in this picture, Penn Park, and then to our right, and that is St. Patrick's Church, where the playground is, where people, the kids are playing on the parking lot. That was the original Potter's Field. People buried there who had no family, no financial needs, or were unidentified. So the process worked like this. The city physician would coordinate the paperwork. The engineer would come out and identify the site and figure out exactly where they wanted to bury the person. And the public's work would come out and actually dig up the grave. Some of the first people who were buried there were mutineers, people who did not listen to their general. So in the uh, Revolutionary War, soldiers actually camped at that park. And there were some soldiers who were upset with the pay. They thought that it was ideal money and not real money. And so they voiced their concerns. So General Anthony Wayne ordered them court martialed and they were killed. They were executed, these mutineers. So it was described as this. The executioners were fellow soldiers with tears rolling down their cheeks in showers. They silently and faithfully obeyed their orders without a moment's hesitation, a most painful scene. And these mutineers were buried in Potter's Field, some of the first ones. Later, we had another interesting figure buried in Potter's Field. Uh, did you know P.T. Barnum came to York? So it, it, in 1872, and P.T. Barnum came, and they were at Penn Park, and they brought uh, these four individuals. They were described as a strange and brainless being said to have been captured somewhere in Central Africa. They were Fiji cannibals. Um, and at night, these performers would stay where the current place where the Judicial Center is. The Judicial Center on George Street was actually a uh, house that people could stay at. So at night, that's where they stayed. And during the day, they performed at Penn Park. Um, she had them were describing people from Central Africa. They were from Georgia. Like P.T. Barnum did not have any shame in trying to false advertise whatever you could do to sell a ticket. So he's going to end up dying, the um, man on the left, shorter one. He dies while he's in York. And here's what a newspaper printed for why he died. He said his health failed because he was obliged to fare on susquehanna shad and the promiscuous variety of viands that constitute the food supply of the average York epicure. <laughs> so basically, York County didn't have good food, and that's why he died. <laughs> A um, newspaper also wrote that when the dead body was discovered, the two male associates were biting and gnawing at the fleshy part of the body with all eagerness of their native cannibalism. Totally fake news. They were not doing that. This was uh, P.T. Barnum paid for a false advertisement to get, get people to go and visit Penn Park and visit what he was doing. Uh, that, that never happened. <laughs> He was buried in York's Potter's Field, and when they buried him, they buried him in his native garb with all his rings and the um, jewelry that he had, his ears, his nose, his bracelets on his wrists. So in the late 1800s, there was this conundrum in York. Uh, it was 1897, and they were thinking about building a school. So if you, right here is where the original Potter's Field was. Here is Penn Park. Here is St. Patrick's Cathedral. And so you can already see what happened. They built a school there. So the, the question was, do we uh, move the bodies or do we keep them there? One of the concerns was that in 1890, the health report, there was a lot of contagious diseases going around in York. 
we had smallpox, diphtheria, scarlet fever, typhoid, and the concern was if we did these people up, is it going to spread and are other people going to sick? So if you move the grapes, smallpox spread, um, the, if we didn't move them, would the residue from the bodies remain in the soil because there were rumors that the heat from the school would cause the organisms to wake up through the school floor and actually like contaminate people, which we know is not how it works, but that was the argument. You keep them in the ground, but then also the challenge is if you keep them in the ground and you don't dig them up too, then when kids are like playing in the playground, are they going to stumble across like a bone um, because they weren't buried properly? These people were buried in uh, bags sometimes, wrapped in newspaper, sometimes in um, sometimes in boxes. But that was very very rare. So it wouldn't have, and also not to depth either, maybe two feet, maybe two and a half feet. So if they were to rise up, you know, with that reduced contagion. So. On your worksheet, if you're following along at the bottom, if you were in charge of the city cemetery 100 years ago, would you move the bodies on the left because you think it's too much of a health crisis and these possible outbreaks? Or would you have just built them on top? It's not worth digging these people up. It's wrong and it seems expensive. How many of you would have moved the bodies? How many of you would have buried a uh, dog on top? So what they decided to do was exhume them, over 600 bodies. The process was cumbersome and dirty and, uh, as you can imagine, very unsanitary. I don't have any pictures of it, but I do have a picture from Gettysburg. So this is not an um, actual picture of Potter's photo, be very clear with that, but it is a Gettysburg photo of them who body sat with it and shown with it as a duck. You can see that he's got a hook over here. That's how they would have pulled them up with a hook. When they started digging up the bodies in Potter's Field, they noticed they planted trees there and the tree roots had actually grown around the bodies. So to exhume them was a, a, a very challenging process. I mean, I, I can imagine what that would have been like. 75 to 100 workers in New York were employed to exhume them. And there were a lot of heavy rain and thunderstorms figure. So it was described in the newspaper as a sea of mud, which you shout out to the History Center. I used a lot of their archives for this information as well as newspapers.com. And most of these first bodies were African-Americans that were wrapped in blankets. Some they say were remarkably well-preserved um, and there was only one casket that was found. And they did find people that were buried three and four times. And this was in 1897? So back to the Fiji cannibal. During the exhumation process, they did uncover his body on April 8th. Uh, and they didn't want to dig up the entire body because they wanted to wait until the next day when they were exhuming all uh, 600 people. But then the next day, when they opened up his coffin, the legend says that his body was missing because a doctor came and stole his skeleton and cleaned it and hung it up in his office for people to come and look at. Also, do you remember all the garbs I was telling you about the jewelry that were on his fingers and nose and ears? They were all missing. So uh, we don't know what actually happened to the Fiji cannibal, but uh, he went missing. So when they moved uh, the people from uh, Penn Park, across from Penn Park, up to the current day location where it is, they uh, at first didn't keep records. Uh, they just dumped the individual in what's called a double row of graves. So this is one of the only index of graves that we have. And over on the left in the bottom, you'll see it says, it's kind of difficult to read. I did print a picture on the back of your worksheet. It, it is not easy to read if it's online if you want to read more. Um, but the double row graves on the left is where all 600 people went. And that's it. And there's no gravestones and there's no record. And we don't know much about those people. The only way that we can uncover the stories that we have is because of the newspaper of the other side, which you all know were exactly factual correct, actually correct. So it's been challenging to say the least. Um, and the only reason why we even have uh, this index of grades in the first place, which is from 1930, is because there was a um, young mother who lost her baby. And her baby was born in Potter's Field, and she would go every day to visit her where she thought her baby was. And eventually, when she raised enough money to exhume the bodies and move it to a different location, 
when they turned the body, it was a grown man skeleton. It wasn't even her baby. And that she never knew where her baby was born or I was buried. So that's when they decided to start this index of graves to actually keep somewhat of a record of the people. So what you're saying is that the known plots all come after 1897. Technically 1930. The question was, um, are all the known plots 1897? Yes, but this index of graves wasn't even until 1930. Okay, so they dumped all the people that they moved into that one little area and then just randomly buried people in the, the remaining parts. Yeah, and but then in the 30s, they decided to be a little more organized. About them. Exactly right. Okay. But what's interesting about Potter's Field is that they're going to increase in the use. And that is because uh, in the 1800s, we're going to see this commodification of the funeral industry. So uh, basically, people started saying, let's make funeral, let's make money off of this. Um, let's make funerals more elaborate. So they started having interior casket trimmings, extensive outfits, they have embalming process. And if anyone in this room has been familiar with someone who recently passed, this is expensive process. This is very expensive. And so this wasn't until the late 1800s. So as you can imagine, people are going to need potter's fields because they can't keep up with the increasing price to be able to bury people. So that's why we're going to see even more people buried in potter's fields after the 1800s. Now on the back of your worksheet, I think this is very interesting. Looking at class and how people who did not have a lot of money were treated. Feelings towards poverty has changed when you think about lower income, middle and upper. So if you were to guess which one of these would be the most explanation for the time period as to why people were poor, the first one is just individual explanations. It's their personal choice and a character flaw. There's something wrong with them. Second one is structural expl explanations, like societal norms, the laws and the system. There's something that's keeping them down. And the last one is fatalistic explanation, uncontrollable, bad luck or accidents, or even like Calvinism, thinking about God created it for them. During this time period, the correct answer would be individual explanations. It would have been, it's a personal choice. There's nothing um, that they did to help themselves. They, divert, they deserve to be buried in Potter's Field. Um, now, thankfully, I'll say that the attitude towards, attitude towards people in poverty has changed a lot. I think we're a lot more understanding of people that come from lower incomes. Um, but during this time period, they would have just been marginalized and pushed to the outskirts. So one of those people who would have been pushed to the outskirts is Squire Braxton, and his story is fascinating. So Squire Braxton was uh, born in slavery in Virginia, and he came to York in 1827. He was approximately 43 years old. He came to York on a Conestoga wagon, and when his owner set him free, he advised him that he should go above the Mason Dixon line because he did not want to risk any slaveholders catching him and returning to bondage if he was uh, below the Mason Dixon line. So he said, go up to Pennsylvania. And so that's why he hung out then in New York. And this is where he stayed. He lived in what's described as a hut in Penn Park. It was built out of old boards and logs covered in sheets of tin. He had no family. He lived alone for his entire life. He would be known to prepare meals out on a fire uh, out in Penn Park, which I think is just really interesting. He was also known for all his cats and dogs. He was said to have over a dozen dogs that he took care of. Unfortunately, the neighborhood boys didn't respect him very much. Uh, uh, those York City boys were known to go up to his hut and take pebbles and throw them at his house. So then it would hit his roof and wake him up and the dogs would start barking. He would come out and scream at them. So uh, they antagonized poor Squire Braxton. Squire Braxton said that he owned uh, Penn Park. This is before the park, by the way, and comments. He said he owned the deed and he had 16 acres um, that was just described as a wasteland. We said, why can't I live here? There were a few times where people camped on his, his property and he viewed it as like an infringement of his rights. He said, these people are coming in and kind of like taking over my land and squatting. So, for example, New York County, they had their fair uh, and they had set the exhibits down in Penn Park. And they said, here are some free tickets. And he was kind of ticked off about that. 
Uh, then the Civil War, the home was invaded by this, you know, the pet bark was used for soldiers to come as barracks and a hospital. He was ticked off about that. Uh, but, and then so eventually, especially during the Civil War, they ordered him to move his cabin. So the legend goes that he got his old nag and he moved his cabin uh, down the road and he wasn't in their space anymore. Uh, we don't know if he like owned it. Probably not. There was no deed ever found, um, but he, he just claimed squatter's rights. How he made money is that first, when he first came to York, he worked as a domestic servant in people's houses, serving them. Uh, but eventually, he gained more money uh, by uh, basically picking up, up trash. So Civil War officers paid him to dispose of his trash. And then he also used his horse, the wagon, to go around York. And this is before automobiles. So people had horse and wagons, that's how you got around. And so you can imagine what happened in the streets in New York City. Uh, there was a lot of we'll use word manure that was left. And so Squire Braxton would go around his little cart and he would pick up the manure and he would sell it to local farmers for them to put in their harvest. So he was pretty ingenuity. He figured out how to make money. One of the ways that he made money, I just heard the word stinky that he used, <laughs> was he would skin dead horses and cows. And then he would tan their hides and he would sell their hides. But then he would just throw the carcasses on like a pile in the commons. You talk about stinky. <laughs> and so the borough asked him eventually to move this pile because it was described as a horse gutter and it smelled so bad that people supposedly got sick when they would walk past. So the last few years of his life, he died in 1881. He spent in the alms house. Um, and when he passed, he was buried in Potter's Field, and he was taken care of by the public. Supposedly, when he passed, uh, 500 people came to his funeral, which is, I mean, a huge amount of people. Um, and then when his remains were moved from the original location up to the current location, they said that his uh, friends actually made a head marker for his grave. Now, I'm not sure, again, if they actually knew it was him or not. I can't imagine that process being very organized. There were uh, some headstones, but they were made out of wood. And so you can imagine 100 years later, they haven't survived. So getting on to now, the final part of my program. My question, you haven't mentioned this, I'm going to ask. Two questions I had, I've had all along before I ever came here. I've walked in Prospect Hill Cemetery routinely, but I've visited all of this. Who actually owns it and who? Somebody is reasonably well maintained, so obviously somebody's mowing the lawn. So do the dead people. So that's what I wanted to know. Who owns it? It's not in York City. Who owns it and who is providing the maintenance? The question was um, who owns uh, Potter's Field? So it is in North York Borough. York City purchased it, York City owns and maintains it. Okay. Yeah, so that is, you're seeing your city. Yeah, okay. they take care of it. Yeah. All right, thank you. So here is, I mean, that was great, Lita. Thank you. You can see it, it is taken care of. It's mowed. I mean, it's it's not um, beautiful by any means. It, there's definitely weeds growing up in the um, chain of fence that surrounds it. But the whole reason why I got involved in this is that I lived in a new apartment building that they built. I moved uh, downtown in 2020, and my apartment building were those two windows that overlooked City Cemetery. And so I would go for walks at Prospect Hill. It's, I mean, a, a beautiful walk. Um, and one day when I was looking out of my bedroom window, I, I saw some kids playing in this field. People walk their dog. And so I decided to walk around and check it out. And I saw a headstone down there. One single headstone described it as York City Cemetery. And then of course I went online and found Jim McClure's amazing articles. Cause you know, he's like the local historian. So there were local articles that he wrote on it. And I found out about the 800 plus people who were buried here. And that's when I really started to dive into the history. Cause it just blew my mind that I live literally next door to a graveyard. This graveyard didn't even know it existed. So then I presented at um, the Pennsylvania Association of Gravestone Studies at Penn State Harrisburg, I'm sorry, Penn State York, and the mayor was there, Mayor, Hel mayor Helfrich, and he came up to me at the end of it, and he said, Jamie, I'm into local history, and I didn't even know that was there, or that the city owned it. Why isn't there a monument? And my response was, I know, right? You should put in a monument. And he said, good luck with that. 
So I started doing the research and came up with a plaque and looked at the prices and then met, met with him. Um, he asked for a $5,000 um, uh, management fund to take care of it once we do install it because he, he is sustainably minded. And then after I pitched it to him, he said, this is awesome, totally in support. You're going to have to raise your own funds. <laughs> so then I started the process of raising money and, and that's where we're at now. So we have this agency through Preservation Pennsylvania. Um, after we, after I did this research, the first thing I did was form an awesome committee who is equipped with people who are very knowledgeable and helpful. We got fiscal agency. If anyone in this room is thinking about raising money for a cause, because I'm just a history teacher, like this is just something, this is my passion project that I care about, but I'm, I'm not getting paid for this. But if you are taking money, you don't want that money in your name. You want fiscal agency because you don't want to be responsible that so it is an organization who is your kind of umbrella that just protects you and preservation pennsylvania is our fiscal agent then we found a monument that we wanted to use which i'll show you pictures here we fundraise uh, and then we spent the past year fact finding continuing our research one of the coolest things this is all online if you go to witnessingyork.com the website i co-run with jim mcclure on witnessingyork.com i have a list of names that we know and we have over 270 names that we've acquired. It is way more than the index of grades that you have here. And it's mostly because of newspapers.com and find a grade. So you have access to this chart. Uh, nothing is, there's no paywall. You can just go click on it and you can see all the people buried there. They, we have their first name, last name, occupation, veteran status, family names, age of death, why they died, and you can go and look at it. And it's really interesting because uh, race and gender really made a difference. Um, looking at, if you read the stories and how people were treated, it was, just, it was fascinating. Another thing we did was we used ground penetrating radar, which is a um, machine that you see there that uses, um, darn it, I forget the exact name of it. They use some type of radar with the exact name, I'll go look it up. And they penetrate the ground and then it gives you a readout of any uh, obstructions in the ground. So it will show you if there's any change in the composition, a body or a hole or a pipe. So this professor came out, she's from Put Sound with a bunch of students and they went and they went up and down Penny Heaven to try to um, locate where people are buried. So I have a quick video of it. So here you can see that they, it's 180 feet. So they mapped out these lines every, every foot. And then do you see the red box at the bottom? That is what's reading the ground and putting the radar into the ground. So they walked up and down and they were there all day. It took hours and hours. And she didn't charge us either. She just did this because this is part of her job at Put Sound, which I really appreciate. And all the students didn't get paid either. And it was also fascinating. I mean, compare this to your index of graves, where you can see where people are buried. It is correct. You can see the graves. Do you see, though, where the double row graves were? There's really no evidence. Here are the double row graves. Can't really tell that anyone was buried there. So at the back of all the fence line with Prospect. Yeah. Yep. Um, this is Prospect Hill. Uh, this would have been my apartment, Schley Alley. And then this is. Um, like this is the road then would be over here. Yep. So this has been really helpful with figuring out where we want to put the monument because we don't want to put the monument on top of somebody. So we are thinking that the monument will probably be over here. This is the hole in the ground they found, and there are some people buried down here. Um, but we're thinking the monument will be right about when you drive in, um, so people can actively see it from the roadway. So there, yeah, there you can kind of see the comparison. So as I'm kind of, uh, I still have a few minutes of this presentation, but we're kind of nearing the end here. I wanted to take a second to talk about the only gravestone that is there. This is the only stone that they have. Um, and it was dedicated by a bunch of students in 1995. The reason why they found out about three cemeteries is because they learned about the story of Clash A. Johnson. And it's a very sad story. Um, Clash A. Johnson was um, a toddler and he died, he was placed in a tub of scalding water by his mother. And so she left him there and he ended up dying from the scalding water. 
It wasn't immediate. It took him a couple months. He was sent down to Baltimore for treatment. They couldn't do anything. He eventually died from lung and heart failure. Um, then this is pretty gruesome, but I do think that history is rated R and we need to learn about what actually happens. Um, the um, hospital sent his body back after they did the autopsy to figure out why he died, still like laid open. They didn't even bother to really close him up. And since the family didn't have a lot of money, how they buried him was they went to the dollar store and got one of those foam coolers. And they put cliche in a foam cooler and super glued the lid shut and buried him that way. If you look, he died in 87. Like it isn't that long ago. The last known burial, it burial 2004. Like if this isn't, it is a historical site, but it's still being used. And also they didn't even bother to stop his name correctly in the index of graves. But also makes research very difficult as well. If you were to go and visit him and you can compare your the index of graves with the actual location, he's buried at Platte 423. So are you saying in 1987 it was a it was legal to bury a person like that? Public works crew would have come out and they would have done it. Yes. Um, this is a close-up of some of the names that we have. Um, if you look behind the names, you can see either a B or a W or a C. W would have been for white, B would have been for black, and C would have been for colored. So black and colored, you know, the same thing, African-American in terms of just changed over the years. But what I love is that we have a black baby and a white baby that are buried in the exact same grave. And this is during a time of segregation. So in the 1930s, blacks and whites were buried together. I mean, we have Lebanon, which is a historically black cemetery. That was only, really the only cemetery for blacks in the area. But yet, Potter's Field, they're buried side by side. There's no separation. So on one hand, this shows that what race cuts up, class cross up through, cuts through us. But on the other hand, it also shows that this place is a potential for like unity, that we can be buried together. People who were poor really didn't have any uh, differentiating factors. No one cared if you were black or white. It looks the same there when you have another one like that. Right. 354. Yeah. Yeah. And this is just a quick snapshot. I mean, you can kind of see all the different names. Would there have been babies that died around the same time? Um, you mean to be in the same plot? Yeah. I'm not sure about that. I mean, that would make the most sense, but I'm not sure. There is an article in Witnessing New York about a, a scandal that was um, done because there was a baby named Mary who, um, when they buried, so at the time, this would have been in the uh, mid 1900s, apparently the uh, gravekeeper, the person responsible for the plots, didn't take care of it, and he used it to raise chickens and grow potatoes. So he was using it as a as a garden. So eventually, the city got upset with them, and they came out and they said, "You actually have to take care of the people here. You can't because you take in a lot of money to bury them too. You actually can't grow your potatoes here. Like you actually have to use it as a grave site." Um, and so he uh, eventually got tipped. They buried the baby, but they said they only buried the baby uh, two feet, and it had to be more than three. And so that's when they had to go back and dig back the baby back up because they wanted to see if he did it right. And they dug her up and then they reburied her. They found she wasn't buried deep enough, but it wasn't as shallow as what they claimed. And I'm reading the story. You do get a little empathy fatigue because you're just constantly reading story after story that are just sad. But also, who's the real victim here? And his baby. His baby couldn't be at rest. And also the mother who lost her child. Um, so it's a shame that, that all these politics were involved and they just couldn't bury people properly. Uh, out of all the known identities, 41% are black, but those are the known identities. The 600 people that were moved, like I said, were mostly black and we don't know much about them at all. So recently, uh, a bunch of your college students did a lot of research on Penny Heaven and they created an exhibit that's located at the Center for Community Engagement. That's just right down the road from here. So if you want to go and read more about Penny Heaven, they created this amazing exhibit where they dive more into the story, stories they haven't covered today, history of funerals. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. And this will be up all summer long. You can go online for the Center for Community Engagement Hours. It's a really cool exhibit. 
So here's where we're at. Our, this is the monument that we're trying to install. Phil Wall has given us a 50% discount, so thank you to them. Uh, our committee has worked really hard to try to raise this money. Over on the right, that has uh, been our budget. Our goal was $20,000. And because an amazing man in the room named Bob Mann, thank you, Bob, he gave us the final pushover to raise our $20,000. So we did it, but we haven't uh, released this amazing celebration yet because inflation. I reached back out to Phil Bowles and it's going to cost a lot more now to do the same thing that we were trying to get done a year ago. So we're going to uh, hopefully have the monument in this summer. Uh, I'm waiting to hear back. It's also one of the challenges of working within a nonprofit. It moves very slow. So we're working on it, um, but we still probably going to have to fundraise. So to finish here, I just want to remind you where we started this presentation at Prospect Hill. You can see how many stones are there. And then compare that to the city cemetery, where, where there are, are just one, and then still there. Mm -hmm. The reason why this monument matters is for four different reasons. One is that I'd like it to be a site of consciousness, deeper meaning, um, where we can really reflect on um, where we've come from, where we are, and then listening and learning to each other, and then also a place of unity, especially racial unity in New York. I think it's important to highlight that. So to finish, I think that City Cemetery had these unintended messages. It permanently marginalized the poor. They finalized their place in society on the outskirts, identified, unidentified, and forgotten. But what this memorial is going to do is send this new message of recognizing this historically important place, both past and present. If you want to go on more witnessing New York, I also have my email at the bottom of the worksheet. Uh, if you are interested in donating, the QR code will take you to our fundraising page. Um, but other than that, I'm done. So thank you so much for being here. Did you say the last burial there was 2004? Yep. Is, is it still possible to use it? For yes. Um, the new um, method that the city has used is they are preferring cremation right. for people who are still identified uh, or can't afford it. And Hefner is currently housing those cremations. They've dedicated a space where they have them. Um, they're not sure what to do with them. It is growing. Um, but yeah, that's that, that's why we haven't had a burial since 2004. Um, yeah, I used to work in a hospital, and every now and then you get stuck with an unclean body. And there's no, no things change, but there was like no mechanism. And the county coroner really wasn't very helpful. Uh, you could usually find a funeral director who would do it. They rotated. You'd find a country church that had a lot somewhere in the cemetery who would say, you know. Right. Um, but there was no, I never felt that the, the, the county took any kind of major acceptable responsibility for it. Dealing with the image. And how often would you say something like that? It was rare, fortunate. I, I'm curious though, would you say like every couple of years? Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. still though. Yeah. And it, we weren't a big cost. Um, but, you know, there are, like I said, there just wasn't much of a mechanism. Now, I assume they have bodies buried out of plus anchors to the yeah. And the prison. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, even when you think about the Alms House, um, I mean, they were known. Have you ever heard the story of Gettysburg where they would uh, amputate limbs and just throw them out the window? Right. Same thing happened here, too. Um, and so you can only imagine what's under the, <laughs> under some of the grass. Well, I think one reason why I find your project important is if you look uh, global, um, there are millions and millions of people, uh, even in, in the last hundred years, uh, who are just out there because of uh, war and you know mass slaughters of Native Americans and, and uh, what happened in Europe and Ukraine and all these places uh, that are you know in mass graves or whatever, uh, they're still fine. Uh, here, we let's let us hope we're a little more civilized and can do something to uh, 
not treat people is not as right. And to have a system in place um, where people who are already grieving um, don't feel like the weight is on their shoulders, you know, that they're in the process. Well, and to your point earlier, the thinking when all this kind of got started, if you were poor or whatever, it was God was punishing you. It was a moral thing. And the church did not help. Um, fortunate our attitudes are a little more progressive to help. The people do deserve it. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, at least to be um, buried um, six feet deep, where they don't have to be worried about exuding. Yeah, of course, none of these people were ever buried in cribs or box. You know, they were just looking crazy. Yeah, there were a few boxes, but to your point, a few dozen maybe, you know? Yeah, or coolers in some cases. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, I had two questions. I wondered about the hole that you said on, was that specific to German, the Pennsylvania? Oh, okay. and, um, and then the name Penny Heaven. Yes, so for the whole, I'm not sure, and that's really the only one that I found. So I don't want to say that that is like a blanket statement for all Pennsylvania Germans. It could have just been that unique stone cutter that decided that or the family, very individualized. Um, Penny Heaven, that was in an old record that um, someone described the city cemetery as a place where people could go that only had pennies. So it was like a penniless in their heaven. So that's where we came up with the project, Penny Heaven. I'm familiar with Lebanon Cemetery, but not when that was started. And I know historically the Black people were buried there because they weren't allowed to bury them in, in the white cemeteries. But um, so would they only bury the affluent ones? I mean, the ones who had the money to be buried there and if you didn't have the money to it. I don't know how if this cemetery is older than the Lebanon. Yeah, I'm not sure I should know what that is. Yeah. It's a very old grave at Lebanon. At Lebanon but I think yeah. this predates. I think this like predates yeah. it somewhat. But, but Lebanon, you had to buy the lot and yeah. you know, yeah. have it open and all that. Lebanon is actually doing a preservation day as we speak right now. And I'm sure Sam and Norm will watch this later and probably comment with the, the year. But yeah, this was for people who were unidentified or poor. So Lebanon was reserved for people who, I mean, there, there are doctors over there, lawyers over there. Oh, yeah. There wouldn't have been people like that buried at Penny right. Heaven. Um, there were some veterans who were born at Penny Heaven, but the recent one was in the 1960s. There was a man named William who had been exhumed. He was in World War II. And it was just because a neighbor knew about him and he did his grave and reached out to Indian Town Gap and then finally got his body moved. Now he's over at Indian Town Gap, but he was in the cemetery for a long time. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Jamie. That was really interesting and really eye-opening to know that I was right next to your apartment and it's just the history that goes into it. So thank you again. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming out for the second Saturday. Um, things that are coming up the next second Saturday will be in July. We have John Maeda, who is going to be speaking on the history of the Star Family Banner. It being the month of, of course, July 4th or Independence Day, um, taking a deeper dive into uh, how the Star Spangled Banner came to be, um, the American flag, and the song that goes with it. Uh, coming up this month as well, next Wednesday, the 14th, we are rolling out a brand new program. It's called Hidden Histories. Hidden Histories is going to shed light on stories of people, stories done by people, or interesting facts that may have not always been in the spotlight. You may have heard of somebody, but you may not know the little intricacies within their life. Uh, so next Wednesday, retired pastor Guy Dunham will be speaking across the street at Cafe 225 in First Presbyterian Church. That is from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. discussing the life of David Edder Small, during the 1800s, an advocate for uh, civil rights and abolition. 
Um, so if hidden histories are not going to be held at the History Center, we are hoping to expand and broaden our reach with our community partners uh, so that people can go and experience the stories where the stories happen. So next Wednesday is going to be at First Presbyterian Church, 6 to 7. And then finally, next Friday, uh, the 16th, is our uh, quarterly program, Spirits of the Past, a historic mixology course. This one is called A Sip of Summer. <laughs> Two cocktails that we are going to be enjoying that day is the Hurricane, made famous down in New Orleans, combining multiple different kinds of rum and fruit juices together. And then something called an avo passion. You won't find it published anywhere. Um, I actually stole it from a bar that I used to frequent uh, back in my hometown in Eastern Pennsylvania. The avo passion combines Blanco tequila and muddled avocado. So if you're interested in trying that out, come and check us out. Here's a fast night Friday. Um, but again, thank you so much for coming out and thank you, Jamie. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't sign it. You don't have to sign it. Oh, okay. I don't have to sign it.